Hello, this is Minder Chen. Uh, this is the entrepreneurship video series, and this is the second installment of Innovation in New Economy. Last time we talked about some of the fundamental issues about innovations and, and different type of innovations, and today we're going to talk about uh, several innovation theory. The first one is Innovation Diffusion Theory by Avery Roger. And his theory is well documented in his book called Diffusion of Innovations. And I believe it is in its fifth edition now. And um, Roger studied several innovative technology and found that there's a common pattern in terms of how this uh, new technologies um, have been adopted over time. And initially, you attract about 2.5% of innovators who are brave enough to adopt and, and play with the new property and stable technology. And then followed by early adopter, which is about 13.5%. And the third cohort is the so-called early majority. And there are, the population is under this area. And, and then you reach a kind of um, a critical in, inflection, um, inflection point, which means that the adoption rate start to decline. You see a gradual pickup of adoption rate and, and to pick over here. And the lay majority join the, the crowd, which count for 34%. Uh, this is 34% of the overall potential population of all the possible adopters. And there are so-called lagger, which counts for the rest, which is about 16%. And so if we use the accumulated um, kind of curve, which is um, a shape of S, so we call it S-curve, it indicate the cumulative number of adopter over time. So you will see actually the adoption um, um, of the new technology in terms of the cumulative number of adopters um, would have this S-curve shapes. So it start to pick up quite dramatically over here particularly but then start to, to slow down, eventually tapering off, and potentially may even actually drop like this. Okay, And certainly we all know that some innovative technology did not even take off. They may start it here and then eventually uh, go down before it's, it, it goes through the, um, it's adopted by some early majority. And so this is kind of idea case of the new technology which you adopted by uh, all its adopters in the potential marketplace. And one of the important um, findings by Rogers, uh, which uh, can be very useful for us who are engaged in starting up a company and creating new product and services, is the five factors he identified in terms of why uh, some emerging technology got adopted faster than others. Uh, so this is called five factor of in innovation adoption decision. Um, people who decided to adopt innovation uh, based on the following factor. One is that uh, the innovation presents uh, a relative advantage over the old one. It's faster, cheaper, uh, and and better in certain way, better quality, or have some unique characteristics. Um, so that's the relative advantage. Uh, this is pretty obvious. The second is called compatibility. Um, probably we can refer to it as a backward compatibility or compatibility with some um, mainstream product. Uh, for instance, if you adopt my new word processor, it is compatible with Word or uh, Microsoft Word, which um, has a newer version, but it's backward compatible with their own old version. And that is what we call compatibility. Uh, and in this case, if everybody follows a certain industry-wide standard, that will ensure some compatibility as well. 
The third is simplicity. Um, here we, we list a simplicity of complexity, but it's really simplicity over complexity. Uh, if you have um, simpler to, in terms of user interface and, and in terms of how people can quickly learn about your product because it's um, simple design, it will give you uh, advantage over a wider spread adoptions. Triability. Uh, triability really means that people can try out the innovation without um, invest a lot of money. Uh, for instance, a free download, a trial version of a software for 30 days is an example of triability. Or for instance, before you purchase a book from Amazon, Amazon um, some of the book at Amazon, sold on Amazon, actually allow you to read uh, maybe a chapter or two. Uh, that's an example of triability. So you feel more comfortable in terms of what you're um, getting into. The last one is the very interesting one. It's called observability. Observability means that your um, innovation is uh, visible to others. Uh, for instance, if you come up with a really great desktop-based uh, gaming machine, um, you may not get a lot of observability because people play game at their own home. So even it's a great machine, but not many people are aware of it. Uh, however, uh, let's use um, iPad example. Um, when iPad um, came out, uh, people who owns the new iPad bring the iPad to meeting uh, to sometimes uh, just go out and still bring the iPad and they're uh, kind of using it at the meeting, at a, at a restaurant. And so it's out there for people to see. People will say, hey, what is that? Uh, what are you doing? Um, that actually gives a lot of publicity, that observability actually give the publicity, free publicity of the innovative product uh, for the company. So you definitely want to uh, think about observability. Um, another example um, in terms of observability is uh, Intel's um, marketing campaign called Intel Insight. If you actually own uh, Intel PC or laptop, you will see a logo called Intel Inside or Pentium Inside earlier. And in this case, um, Intel CPU certainly is a critical component for a laptop or um, desktop computer. Um, but most of the end user um, just really don't care. And so many years ago, Intel came up with this Intel Insight campaign. They actually um, give money to PC producer to put that logo on their machine, um, so that and so that the end user will see, hey, what does that mean for Intel Insight? And then they start saying, hey, this is the heart of the. Um, of a great computer, so you definitely want to use the best processor or CPU, which is Intel. And that actually is an example of make something which is really not physically um, observable um, and, and, and try to give it some exposure to the end user. Um, and, and personally, I believe that's the greatest um, kind of marketing initiative um, in the P in the computer industry, uh, in this case by Intel. So remember the observability, okay? For instance, if you own a Mac, you find out there's a logo, pretty clear logo, Apple logo on the uh, cover of, uh, of the Mac. Uh, if you really look at the um, the direction of the logo of that Apple logo, uh, you will find out if you close your uh, the Mac uh, laptop, uh, you will find out the Apple to the user it's upside down. Uh, so that doesn't seem to be right. But if you think about it from Apple's viewpoint, you are if you're using Apple's computer, you're already the adopters. So to some extent, they don't really need to use that logo to impress you. But when you use your computer in front of the public, 
you um, then you will open the cover of your laptop and that was upside down to you but when when you open it up um, the the um, logo is right side up uh, which is the correct way for others to see so actually when Apple kind of design the placement of the logo they actually debate about which way the logo should be which direction the logo is supposed to be displayed and eventually they certainly come to conclusion this is actually for other people looking at the owner of the uh, MacBook uh, to see the logo so they place it in the way that when you open the um, the MacBook, um, the logo is in the right direction for others. Roger also um, come up with a process for the uh, innovation adoption decision. Uh, first, you uh, from the inventor's viewpoint, you invent something, and then as a product and service and then you need to persuade others to kind of use the innovation and the users who need to make a decision would assess, collect information um, try, maybe try out your stuff and, and eventually make a decision whether they want to adopt the innovation or not they may reject it, which they abandon the emerging technology or they would accept it. Uh, once accepted this is called adopt. They will adopt on um, your t um, technology and, and then they will go through an implementation phase. In the implementation phase uh, people may, uh, the, the users community may adapt the technology uh, to its specific um, issue or problem they try to solve. So there's an adaptation involved uh, during that implementation which is uh, very important and sometimes those adaptation may lead to further innovation. Uh, we, we actually call that user-generated innovation. Um, we will discuss that a little bit later. And Jeffrey Moore who wrote a a book called Crossing the Chasm um, use Rogers uh, adoptions um, model and came up with this uh, he called it technology adoption life cycle um, you don't see much difference here it's still the same kind of bell curve but he identifies something called the chasm which means that uh, in bringing a new technology from the early market which is innovator and early adopter uh, to the kind of mainstream market which is some of the early adopter and the early majority and certainly including the late majority uh, there is a, a gap um, he called it chasm um, that means converting convincing actually some of the early adopter and particularly the early majority to use your products takes a lot of efforts and a lot of time we underestimate the effort and innovator by the way and some of the early adopter they're willing to try anything new they they're more tolerant in terms of some of the um, bugs in the new products uh, as long as it has some feature they really want they're willing to give it a try and so they're more tolerant in that case um, so when you're thinking about um, bring your product to the marketplace um, if it's really new you are facing first the innovator and early adopter however to make a transition to the mainstream market uh, listed here uh, you need to actually um, constantly improving your product and services uh, geared towards those um, early majority and late majority. They probably want simpler product, they want something easy to operate, etc. Okay. Here uh, we have kind of another uh, f term to describe the innovator called techie. Uh, they try anything new. 
and the early adopter is called visionary. Uh, they go ahead, they go, they get ahead of the herd. The herd is actually here. They are ahead of the herd, and the early majority are the um, pragmatists. Um, they stick with the herd. Um, and the lay majority are conservative who stick with what has been proven. They really need to see a proven kind of result on uh, the cost benefit, etc. Uh, the the laggers uh, are skeptics. Uh, they pretty much say no to anything new. They're even more conservative than the conservatives. Uh, they are the laggers, so they may be the last uh, cohort to adopt technology. And in some cases, they they may never uh, adopt the uh, the new technology. Gartner is um, a kind of IT research organization that provides research service to um, large organization who require some assessment of the emerging technology or technology products. Uh, so if we they have something called hype curve, which is quite interesting. Which um, we all know that in the IT field, a lot of innovation uh, get a lot of hypes. Um, just use some recent example: uh, big data getting a lot of attentions, um, AI, artificial intelligence through deep learning is getting a lot of attention, robotics. Um, and automobile, uh, a man-driven automobile is another one. Um, so um, Gardner has this pattern called hype cycle, which means that we usually has pretty high expectations uh, when uh, emerging technology occurred. Um, the IT research firm like Gardner usually give a huge number in terms of its potential market. But they may reach um, when the chasm is in front of you. Uh, it may reach actually the peak of inflated uh, expectation, which means people probably has much higher expectation than what the realist, um, uh, what the real world uh, supposed to be. And then since the adoption probably will be much slower or the development of the technology may not move as fast uh, as expected, then the general public went through a so-called throw of disillusion. Um, okay. This uh, illusionment. Um, this illusionment um, basically they they lost kind of the um, the hope um, of the technology and, and start abandoning it sometime. However, if the innovators um, keep working on it, improve it, eventually, gradually, the technology may be accepted by the some of the um, early majority. Then we have a steady climb of the um, of the hope. It's called slope of enlightenment, but enlightenment is not uh, the epiphany. It's actually a gradual um, rising hope. Um, however, once the product become much more mature, uh, we will reach uh, a plateau of productivity here. And so, roughly speaking, this curve just show us that there's kind of overhype uh, at the early stage and then there's kind of over disappointment in my opinion uh, but gradually we come to realize the reality which means um, emerging technology become a little bit more mature we find its use in the right place in in the right customer segment and marketplace and it has its own use it's probably not as great as we expected early on but it does solve certain problem, and and this is a very very common reaction to any emerging technology. So if you compare um, Jeffrey Moore or Avery Rogers' um, technology adoption life cycle with the 
Gardner's hype cycle, you can get a sense, and 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 certainly this this cycle tends to be uh, describing people in the technology field, uh, people who are uh, in the media. Uh, Sometimes they they generate the buzz, and and the technology firm generate the buzz and try to oversell the emerging technology, and this is the uh, real world adoptions pattern. So we, we see that uh, adoption life cycle, you can draw it as a cumulative uh, curve, we call it S-curve. And as a company um, producing um, product technology, innovative one, uh, you are facing the S-curve, uh, which means that your product uh, starts slow in the start phase and then grow, eventually uh, come to a decline or decay. And the starting phase is a, f a ferment um, stage, and then eventually you take off to grow, and then you reach some maturity uh, that you start to see a decline in the adoption rate, um, and, and eventually flattened. Um, and you could certainly um, kind of extend the life cycle of your product by keep optimizing your technology. And then you can kind of extend this and still kind of improve it. Uh, it's, it's performance of your first generation of product um, or technology. Um, the, the other approach is actually um, for any company, you need to think about constantly about your next generations of product. And here, um, we use the term generations because not only if you have iPhone 1 from Apple, Apple probably um, is thinking of, was thinking about um, second generation iPhone, third generation iPhone, sometimes they're thinking about multiple generation ahead of the current uh, products. Um, but the next or next next generation of product uh, need to have some innovative feature to entice the user to buy uh, a new version of the product. If just incremental um, improvement, um, sometimes the adoption rate of the next generation product may not be as high as you wish. So innovative approach uh, may be necessary to start the next generation of the technology product process. And sometimes you may even need to come up with a new business model. But this next generation's uh, product will go through the same S-curve cycle. Uh, certainly, if you have a third generation, then you need to think about that uh, third generation of product early on. The earlier you start worry about what's next, uh, you're better off. Because as we all know that uh, building uh, innovative products takes time and very risky. So you probably want to, once you kind of establish, you probably want to start thinking about what's next. And you probably want to have several possible um, innovative next generation product um, working uh, to get uh, concurrently. And eventually one will emerge and, and become a successful next generation product. So this we usually call this double S curve. Um, this is one way uh, thinking, always thinking about what's next, uh, allow you to keep yourself on the toe and keep innovating. That's the only way you can fend off um, the competitors or find out the t um, the maturity of the product uh, towards the end of its product life cycle. And technology forecasting is very difficult. Here I'm just quoting a few examples of well-known um, cases that, for instance, uh, Tom, Thomas Watson's a chair of IBM, uh, which dominate the mainframe computer market, and once said that I think there is, is a world market for maybe five computers, and he was talking about mainframe computer. But certainly, uh, history proved that uh, he was totally wrong. And Western Union, uh, 
basically turned down um, Bells who invented the telephone and and saying that this telephone uh, Western Union was in the telegraph business and saying that this telephone was just too many shortcoming to be seriously considered as a mean of communication the device inherently of no value to to us so basically they give out this um, telephone industry uh, and away and eventually become relatively irrelevant because telegraph once you have telephone it disrupted the telegraph uh, industry and but it, it's worth paying attention here um, a lot of emerging product initially has many shortcomings and that's relatively true they may not be so stable they uh, they looks like a toy um, but over time they improve dramatically and that's that's where they uh, they will get you um, and this is the case in t um, in the telegraph and telephone industry and Ken Olson is the founder of Digital Equipment Corporation DEC uh, it's in the dominating the mini computer industry um, he did not see um, a desktop uh, at home coming or he didn't see the value of it because well by the way at that time nobody seems to use it um, so he was saying that uh, there is no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home uh, and certainly he was proved just like uh, Watson was um, proved to be totally wrong uh, in predicting the uh, next generation of the computers revolution from mainframe to mini from mini to PC uh, to some extent we can kind of see a little pattern like the dominant player in a particular industry usually they are not the one who play an important role in the next generation of technology or product in the same industry and technology adoption rate has been um, speeding up um, and and for instance here we list some of the um, major innovation uh, in the uh, since the 19th century to to the 20th century uh, we'll find out for instance for the, uh, the time for new technology to reach 25 percent of the u.s population um, like household electricity took 46 years and but we're seeing automobile took uh, 55 years but cell phone took only 13 years and the World Wide Web uh, took only about seven years and so we see a, a acceleration of the adoption rate uh, in general of some of the emerging technology uh, which uh, means that uh, if it's good if you start a company uh, which happened to be betting on really um, the next generation of the emerging technology um, but it's also very scary for well-established uh, industry leader if they don't see what's coming uh, they may be very soon replaced by the new startup company and the emerging technology a lot of time are very disrupted um, and Clayton Christensen, who is a professor, is a professor at Harvard um, Business School, and studied um, some of the technologies which considered disrupted, and he found that a lot of disrupted technology uh, entered the market from the very low end. Uh, they probably initially does not um, have very good performance, uh, probably not very reliable and so low quality and however they may be much lower in price and so they can capture the low end of the market which the mainstream uh, player industry player may not pay too much attention uh, because this usually is a lower profit margin segment so the dominant player may be happy to just even give it up um, however disruptive technology usually use a different 
architectures and and technology. So, uh, so the the architecture allow the technology to improve dramatically uh, in terms of its performance. So over time, you will find that disrupted technology performance. Um, kind of grow almost exponentially and, and then exceed the uh, well-established existing technology. The existing technology, if you actually look at, if there's a curve, this curve actually means that the technology, existing technology do improve over time. But the rate of improvement in performance may not be as fast as disrupted technology. So over time, the disrupted technology will exceed the well-established uh, product or service in the marketplace. Um, we mentioned last time uh, in terms of the digital camera. When digital camera first uh, invented, it's not very good in quality. So traditional camera company don't even pay much attention to it. But uh, from I remember my first digital camera had um, a resolution of 640K, which is not very good, but it is good for just posting a picture on the web. And so people were pretty happy about it. People who adopt it for that purpose is happy about it. If you want to use it to kind of print uh, a photo, it's, it's not very good. But over time, we all know that right now you can easily get a digital camera cheaply with 10 megapixel of resolution. And by the way, you actually get it uh, through your smartphone, which also has a very high resolution camera. And the, the, the some of the recent version of the latest version of the smartphone even have two cameras, one for you to engage in video conferencing, one for you to take picture, etc. So over time, that uh, traditional cameras um, was kind of replaced by the digital camera. And then the digital camera was disrupted by um, device such as smartphones, so which um, may actually disrupt this disrupted technology uh, in this case and make it um, less attractive. Okay, so if you're in the digital camera industry, uh, you may have a hard time figuring out what's next for you. So to kind of summarize um, the disrupted technology uh, mentioned previously by uh, Clayton Christensen, and he classified innovation into two types, sustaining innovation, which are um, optimization, constantly improving it, for instance, adding a few injections uh, mechanism to the automobile is a revolutionary idea. The revolution, um, for instance, from using a horse to um, to to um, carry um, a carriage um, and replace that with automobile. That's a revolution, uh, a very radical things, um, and. The disrupted natures is that innovation that create a new market. Usually, they create a new market, and sometimes a no uh, a low end market or a met um, an, a market that's not um, served by the current technology. They apply a uh, different set of values, uh, which ultimately and unexpectedly overtake uh, an existing market. An uh, example would be a low-priced uh, Ford Model T, which we discussed last time. So the dilemma, uh, the so-called innovative dilemma, is what we mentioned is why some dominant industry player uh, was not able to, were not able to actually catch the next wave of innovations. Um, and to answer that, um, you can study some of the uh, the book by Clayton Christensen called The Innovator's Dilemma. Um, and the subtitle is When New Technology Costs Great Firms uh, to Fail. OK. 
Okay. So a good firm usually they are aware of the innovation. That not that they're not paying attention, but their business setup and environment does not allow them to pursue them uh, when those innovations first arise. Um, a good example would be uh, digital camera was actually invented by Kodak. Uh, but Kodak did not actually make much money out of it uh, because uh, the profit margin for digital camera at that time uh, is relatively low and and Kodak um, was making a lot of money in terms of um, the traditional cameras film so they don't see uh, this is a profitable business okay and and also uh, to develop the emerging product would take some scarce resources away and those um, people who are um, research producing the mainstream product for um, for the dominant industry player uh, they don't want to see their resource to be taken away for some unproven R&D project so uh, so that's why there's sometimes a lot of infightings um, in terms of for resources and and that that's why actually a lot of disruptive technology came from um, startup firms, not um, dominated industry player in in uh, in that product category. Okay, and so disruptive innovation usually they're technology-wise they're pretty straightforward. They have a good architecture for growth, um, for uh, for improvement, and they use a lot of time off-the-shelf components so they can put something together very quickly. Uh, the architecture is simpler. Um, they may not have a lot of features uh, for the customers, uh, but they do give them what they want, and usually with much cheaper price. And and because of that, the um, the dominant player usually see no interest in entering or competing at the low end. Um, and and however, um, however, this kind of emerging technology eventually um, eventually grow uh, and exceed uh, the existing technology. Uh, there's a little story uh, told by Clayton Christensen uh, in in one of his article from Harvard Business Review called How, uh, How Do You Measure Your Life? And uh, it, it's a great article. I encourage you to find the article to read it. Uh, he was telling actually a story at the beginning of that article. Uh, he was asked by An Andy Grove from Intel to come to um, Silicon Valley to uh, to describe his uh, kind of disruptive technology concept and innovator's dilemma. Uh, because someone recommended to Andy Grove say, "Hey, this this guy's stuff is interesting. You should talk to him." So when um, Professor Christensen arrived, um, Andy Grove was um, very busy man. Would say, "Hey, I'm busy. I can only give you ten minutes." Um, imagine, I mean, you pay a lot of money to fly a Harvard professor and only give him. Uh, willing to give him 10 minutes uh, to explain uh, his theory. Um, Christensen pretty much said, no, 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 you need to give me 20 minutes. Uh, so Christensen actually um, kind of explained uh, using the steel industry as an example uh, to illustrate the concept of uh, disruptive technology. And uh, the there's there's a large. There was a large steel um, manufacturers uh, factories in the U.S., but um, but they would mini mill steel mill uh, start to emerge. Uh, they use actually uh, scrap metal, and and be able to produce uh, crowbar, uh, which used for construction. They're not really that high value added steel products. Um, so the big steel factory um, wasn't really interesting in uh, in this um, kind of new approach in productions um, and pretty much gave up that marketplace to them. 
And but over time, um, the mini mill are very very much flexible. Um, if they use uh, raw material other than scrap metal, uh, they can produce really really high quality and specialized steel product. And and that's when they start to grab the market from the big player. Any Grove was a smart guy. When he heard this, he pretty much said, "Okay, say no more. I know what I need to do." And uh, that's when they. Um, came up with the Ceterons processor for laptop computers um, and to fend out some of the um, emerging competitors like AMD and and Clayton Christian, Professor Christian um, in, in, in this case made a wise decision not to actually use semiconductor industry as an example to convince um, Andy Grove what to do. He basically used totally a different unrelated industries example to illustrate the theory and how you apply the theory in your own industry. And if you really understand how this theory was derived and what's the implication to, um, to your own industry, you should come up with the solution. Uh, because no matter how smart you are as a professor from Harvard, you probably would not know the in semiconductor industry as good as uh, Andy Grove, uh, who ran Intel at that time. Uh, so this is another lesson if you are um, a consultant. Um, uh, make sure you understand your boundary and limitation in terms of the domain knowledge. And certainly if you you want to learn as much as about that domain and apply the theory, but if you're consultant um, in in a new domain you're not so familiar with, uh, use your methodology and approach in the theory base uh, to help your client to come up with new ideas. A little bit on another form of innovation called reverse innovation. Reverse innovation um, sometimes is called trickle up innovation. Uh, it's referring to innovation uh, seen or used or developed first in the developing world, um, and before it's, it it is spread to um, the industrialized or developed world. Um, a few example here. Red Bull was um, a functional drink from Thailand. Uh, a guy, a business person from Aust Austria, uh, found this um, functional drink in Thailand uh, during his um, uh, visit to Thailand, and then purchased the right of the recipe and and turned it into a very successful product, um, soft drink product called Red and he certainly has some very unique uh, marketing approach to market Red Bull which also make it successful but the original concept of the drink uh, the functional drink is actually from Thailand uh, Gatorade is another example uh, I believe it's University of Florida's uh, football team's uh, coach uh, want to look at some um, some kind of drink which can help um, its player to kind of recover from the from the game um, during the game or before the game. So so they actually uh, went through some research and found that in Bangladesh that um, the traditional medicines um, practitioner use some kind of the drink which include um, coconuts, uh, hypokite, um, sugar and salt and a few other things to mix together to help patients who are hydrated. And, and play football you sweat a lot so you got hydrated very quickly. So they inspired by that um, treatment and then eventually came up with Gatorade uh, which became a very successful um, product. I think it's now acquired by uh, a, one of the big um, soft drinks company, uh, Pepsi or Coke. 
And GE is big on reverse innovation. Uh, they first developed um, an ultra portable electro uh, cardi cardiograph, uh, electrocardiograph machines uh, for China and India because uh, people there uh, has much lower income, couldn't really afford the very expensive machine even in their hospital. And however, they found out that um, that that design for that extreme kind of poor economy of uh, developing world also bring down the price of the uh, the machine, and, and that machine eventually was sold to uh, in the U.S. and become very successful product, not just in China and India, but also in the U.S. And you will see this ultra portable electrocardiograph machine at the airport or some major uh, public place. Yet another form of user-driven inno uh, innovation is called user-driven innovation, which means that one way uh, to inspire to innovate is to look at how users are currently using existing product. Um, and, and solving their problem. You will find out that uh, user a lot of time will um, put together some ad hoc solutions uh, to, to deal with the problem which cannot be solved by any of the current products. So the producer may inspire by that and actually um, uh, create something for the users um, in a more formal way. Um, and an example in China is uh, a company called Hire, uh, Hire in Chinese. Uh, Hire actually uh, producing um, it's producing a lot of appliances, including uh, uh, washing machines. And one year they found actually in one province there's a lot of breakdown in their washing machine. Uh, so they became curious. So they studied the maintenance record and then asked the maintenance guy and what's happening. And eventually the information they got back is that um, in that region, uh, during certain month, it's, it's the harvest season of potato. And the farmer would actually using the washing machine to wash the potato. And, and that actually um, Kind of jam the um, the water the the outlet of the water going out of the washing machine and and also uh, damage the machine to some extent internally. So instead of blaming the customer, uh, hire actually decided, hey, maybe there's a there's a usage new usage of the washing machine is washing uh, some of the crops uh, for the farmer, uh, such as a potato. And so they actually end up um, invented a new machine and relatively successful product for that purpose. Uh, I believe that machine can also wash um, uh, clothing um, without any problems. So look at new and intended usage of your product give you the inspiration of new product ideas. That is called user-driven innovation. Another innovation here, um, we I call it platform innovations. Um, and in a few examples listed here, uh, this type of platform innovation allow the allow the platform operator to maximizing to maximize asset value. If you look at here, uh, Uber is the world largest taxi company but they own no vehicle. Facebook is the world's most popular media, but they create no content. It's the Facebook user creating the content, and it's the Uber's driver own the vehicle. And Alibaba.com is a B2B uh, e-commerce trading firm, and they kind of match the buyer and the sellers um, for business-to-business -business, uh, transaction. So although they um, facilitate a lot of business, but um, Alibaba.com uh, has no inventory. And Airbnb is the world's largest uh, hotel 
uh, quote unquote here what they call the largest accommodation provider but Airbnb owns no real estate they don't own even a single hotel rooms so the platform is what makes this happen which means the platform um, connecting demand and supply of valuable sometimes idle asset okay valuable but idle and used asset drives the value creation in uh, in the four cases present here um, so this is another um, kind of innovation worth paying attention I call it platform innovation and Henry Chesbers, a uh, professor at UC Berkeley, uh, is, was promoting something called open innovations. And when you look at um, ideas for innovations, uh, sometimes the innovation can from can may come from internal R and D effort, but you can also licensing uh, external uh, technology, um, and and then you can develop your product and service um, your invention can be licensing out uh, or if it's a university you can spin off a company etc um, during your development process you can further um, kind of insourcing external technology um, to help you to speed up the development process and eventually what you come up with um, your innovation um, you can apply it in the current market or find a new marketplace for it so you work with some such partner to either um, kind of use their IP or invention uh, for your product development and you can also uh, licensing those that you have developed to others uh, instead of try to uh, develop the final product you can licensing some of the technology piece to others and this is actually called open innovation so be open-minded uh, tap into what's available also be able to uh, sell or license what you have to others instead of building the final product you can license the sound of the technology piece and and generate revenue as well uh, this is particularly true for R&D company base company let's look at um, just a rough we call it innovation um, arithmetic um, and we all know that innovation can be a risky business um, in this case certainly this is not um, by any means the uh, the statistics represent the all the possible sample space <coughs> in this case if we have a thousand ideas we may take some action to experiment on them uh, on one tenth of them to, to conduct experiment and some of the experiment outcome is good so another one tenth of them become a specific project we're pursuing R&D project and out of those project maybe only very few uh, one maybe three uh, may become the winners um, to become a successful product or services and over time uh, your investment in those experiment or project or building the final product will require much more resources and the risk uh, since there's more res resource that are required so you actually increase the risk um, the or the loss uh, if you fail so um, so we'll see this kind of a pattern in terms of um, has lots of ideas but at the end only very few uh, winning um, products and so you may ask like, like how do we deal with this uh, arithmetic how can we increase our success rate um, there's really no simple answer to that but let's look at um, 
this diagram first. From idea to product service or a business model, you need to ask a bunch of questions. Uh, first, is it possible, visible? Is it attractive? Has large enough market? Is it doable uh, technically? So these two are similar. Uh, this attractive is, is it what our customer want? And how can we implement it? Okay. Uh, edit um, one said that between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response, falls the shadow. The conception is the idea. From the idea to the creation of the product and services, we've, we're facing a lot of challenge. So how do we deal with this challenge? Um, one way is to actually have a so-called stage gate model. We would set up kind of milestone or st uh, st gates um, to try to come up with a lots of ideas and then screen or filtering uh, some of them out based on certain criteria and so define proper scope for the idea to pursue and build the business case, develop prototype, test and validate the prototype, eventually develop a full version product to launch. <clears throat> and over time you're reducing the number of ideas that you're working on. Another curve, um, it's called startup curve. Um, and here you're seeing an example of it. This is kind of like a little bit like that high um, cycle by Gartner Group. Um, the curve, in my opinion, represents the emotional curve. Um, people are very excited about some innovation, but when re reality set in, uh, the the enthusiasm start to drop. And, and then in the early startup phase, uh, you're always facing um, the reality of lack of tractions. Um, you don't have a lot of paying customers, etc. But through um, um, really good uh, implementation executions ability, uh, you gradually implement turn the pro prototype to a minimum viable product to the minimum viable product to uh, a more full-blown product. Uh, you're building up your skill set, the networking with partners, etc. And, and reach out to customer and get enough funding. <clears throat> and when you reach the product market fit, and then you can start to grow your business and to scale it up. And, and eventually you will become well-established uh, firms. Um, SME means small, medium-sized enterprise. Um, and, and so from product building eventually to company building. So you kind of go through this. When, when, you, when you don't have a lot of traction, you're pretty flat and low in terms of your emotion. Um, you you conduct different type of experiments and and try to figure out the right direction for the product development and so you're constantly are pivoting to try to adjust your strat product strategy and direction. Last, uh, let's talk about just five innovation methods um, to um, help us to uh, understand um, innovation. Um, and use it as a conclusion. Uh, myth number one, people know what they want, just ask them. In reality, people are reliable and knowing what they want. So the solution is to determine their preference, um, their uh, observation. Um, you, you don't get good answer by just asking, what do you want? Tell me what you want. Observe what they do is probably a better better way. Myth number two, ROI is the most important innovation metrics. Um, 
uh, we often conduct in, in uh, major capital investment uh, return on investment uh, symmetrics. Um, but in reality, ROI does not work in exploration mode, which is in startup mode, because there are too many unknowns to make uh, accurate predictions. The solution is adopt um, a goal post and time to choose measure. And we'll explain that in the next slide and uh, metrics and measurement to manage the uncertainty. So time to choose measure. In this case, try to obtain some quick wins. Uh, create prototype very quickly and try it out, hopefully in the marketplace. And the second is to, to um, need some moderate work, which means that we need to spend a little more time then that quick prototype, uh, we run a high velocity, low cost experiment in the area of uncertainty and importance. Um, and we try to run those experiments uh, in a month and, and to validate our um, some of the hypothesis in our business model. And then another way to um, to some measurement is through uh, some A-B test. This is particularly popular for uh, digital innovation, like uh, an app or online websites. And we aim to use A-B test to all customer interface and, uh, and make changes to those interface as, uh, based on the customer feed feedback. And this certainly requires some commitment um, by the company who developed the product and services. Myth number three, you know who your best innovators are. Um, we probably thinking about people in the R&D lab, but in reality as many of your best innovators are invisible to you. So you need to look for innovator in unlikely places. Uh, in this case, including some of your advanced users or some of the non-users uh, of your product and services. Uh, myth number four, the value of the new idea is self-evident. Okay. And reality is new idea do, a lot of time do not sell themselves. Uh, the best idea often start off looking stupid. Okay. Remember those disrupted technology, a lot of time when they just came out, they're, they're not really good. Um, so the solution is to sell the value of the new idea. Uh, show the product not to tell. Show, don't tell. Myth number five. Um, big problem require big solution. Uh, we all want to think big. Okay. Um, reality is small changes can have extraordinary effect if you know where to look. So the solution is focused on the little elephant. Little elephant here is referring to micro in innovation. Uh, some of the innovation seems to be subtle, small, but it can grow and eventually become innovation um, that has greater impact. Okay, so in this segment, we kind of introduce different um, innovation theory, including innovation diffusions, uh, disruptive technologies, open innovation, reverse innovation, platform innovation, etc. And the whole purpose is to inspire you to kind of thinking about different way that adoption, uh, innovation uh, being adopted and how you can actually um, kind of taking advantage of some of the theory to help you to identify innovation opportunity and also to uh, manage the innovation process um, to gain higher um, successful rate uh, for your innovation endeavor. So that's all. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.